Graffiti, the signs and symbols of a California street gang, a fraternity of crime and violence. This is a public display telling everyone that this is protected territory. The names of current gang members are written on this wall, as well as the names of past gang members who were killed defending this neighborhood. To have your name on this wall means that you've made a lifetime commitment. As their saying goes, blood in, blood out. Once you're in the gang, the only way out is death. In a sense, that's true. But there is another, better way of escape that means life. But don't take my word for it. Listen to someone who has actually been there and lived to tell his story. Hello, this is Tommy Scott, and I'm here today to share uh, about the life of crime, drugs, gangs, and uh, destruction uh, that I lived in my life. And well, throughout the course of my life, you know, I, I've, by all the hatred and anger, and just, uh, you know, I, end, I ended up in 17 different facilities, different jails, prisons, juvenile facilities, and camps, and things like that throughout my throughout my lifetime. As a result of my environment, and just uh, the whole, the whole life, the whole, my whole lifestyle, the way I thought about life, uh, my upbringing. You know, in my community, you have over about 2,500 gangs, LA County, and in LA, it's, 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 it's most of, it's so much uh, gang, black on black crime, gang wars, uh, people dying all around you. We saw as kids, we saw so much death, so much hatred uh, for, for each other and people outside of the community. We hated everybody. We just didn't, you know, that was our peer, our upbringing. Everybody around us was, hey, you know, they don't like you, you know, so forget them. And it's all about me, get money for me, rob people for me, uh, destroy people's lives so I can so I can get mine. And, you know, also growing up there, you need protection. You know, you get, uh, if I live in this area, you're already tagged part of that area. No matter, even if you're a gang member or not, you're tagged. You live over there, that's where you're from. And uh, you, can, you can get killed just for living in that neighborhood and you're not even a gang member. And you have to be a tough skinned person to grow up where I grew up at. I mean, there's no ifs and ends. If you wasn't down or, or, or ready to, to ride with our neighborhood, you stay home or you go to school and you go play basketball. You know, you don't hang out, you don't come outside and hang out because you know, that's where you get put on the hood like I did. For me, it all started around 11, 12 years old and well, no father in the picture. I, I had other fathers in the neighborhood, which were gang members and drug dealers. It, it, uh, they, I took a liking to them. They took me in like a, like a son and like a brother. In fact, I had some of them call me son and brother. And uh, they, taught me how to, they taught me how to sell drugs. They taught me how to steal. Taught me how to gang bang. Taught me how to uh, steal cars. The guys that I looked up to in my neighborhood were Stone Cold Killers. Uh, they'll they'll shoot you, take everything you have, take your life uh, at the drop of a dime. 
for some money, for whatever it may be, if you're from another neighborhood. And so I looked up to them. You know, I looked up to them as, you know, they had a lot of money. They had cars, girls. They had all, they had everything that uh, a kid in my neighborhood always wanted was to be somebody, was to be something, to have something so that others can look at us and say, you know, he's cool. We was at war with different gangs all the time. Uh, we couldn't go to a certain store because a gang member here might shoot you or kill you or, or jump you. Um, we was in multiple gang wars. Uh, my my homeboys in my, my neighborhood that were my big homeboys, they'd tell you to do something and it's like you got to do it or you're disciplined. That discipline means you're getting beat up or you're getting shot. I mean, if somebody comes to shoot at us, we better go shoot back at them. If we were going to war with somebody, they'll come get me. Let's go, you know, let's go. They just got at our homeboy. Let's go get them and let's roll. Let's go. And you better not say no, you know, then you're a punk, you know. That's what they look at, you know. You, you can't say no or you're not really down for the hood. So we always have to go no matter what it was, whether it's beating somebody, robbing somebody, whatever it is, robbing another drug dealer, anything. It, we had to be there no matter what. And I was there. I was the first one there, hothead. I was very hot. And... People liked me for that, and I, and I think I drew off of that. I think I drew, uh, I had a lot of pride because of that. My nickname was Hitman on, on the street. Uh, and people came to me for guns. They came to me when it was time to go to war with other gangs. And you know, we also, in our neighborhood, we also saw a lot of death. Uh, we saw uh, people killed right in front of us, blood on the concrete. And, you know, we, we saw many deaths. We saw a guy with his throat split uh, right there in front of us. We saw another one of our friends kill a guy in front of us. Um, cops uh, shooting at us, crooked cops planting drugs and guns. Um, it was chaotic. Uh, we saw so much death and destruction to where we didn't even care. Now that I look back, I had a suicidal mentality, like I was invincible. I remember one particular time where I I had a, a, a gun in my hand and I was going to shoot at these guys in the park and they, they kind of like some guys came out the corner and, and I saw death like at least five, six times in my life, let's put it like that. You know, I, me, I came to one death situation where I was coming out of a store and a guy comes up, one guy has a gun, one guy has a knife, and he slits me from the belly button up to the heart and tore some tissues on my heart. But uh, I was brought through that, I came through that, and shot at plenty of times. I've lost personally myself for probably about 30 friends. Uh, one in particular that really touched me was my friend Lee. We actually got put on our gang the same time, and, uh, and he was shot up 36 times. That, that crushed me. And I think after his death, after his mom, his brother and sister, she just developed a hatred for me and for, for, for all of us, the whole gang. But I think that after his death, despite all of that, I became more numb to death. And I just didn't care about death. I actually, I got worse. I had two kids, I had my two oldest kids, and then my, the woman of my life came into the picture and we had children, so now there's children in the picture with the life uh, that I've been living, life only life I knew how to live. And with that being said, you know, with me developing a record um, from an early age, it was hard to get a job and try to change something, even if I wanted to change it, because I had a record. So nobody wanted to hire me. Nobody really wanted to give me a chance because if I was a thief or a robber, you know, uh, they wouldn't want to work, let me work in their job. So I. I started off on doing bigger robberies, doing bigger, trying to make more money and do whatever that, whatever I could to provide for my family. And I was a failure at it because I stayed in and out of prison. I started going to prisons and I kept living that life. I didn't, there's no other way to, to, to provide for them. There was no other way to provide for them whatsoever um, in my eyes. And, you know, with that being said, then, I mean, well, my hands were in the air. I'm like, okay. Um, lights are off. I need the lights paid. I need to go rob somebody. I need to, I need to do something to provide for them. And so, not being able to do that, I started. Uh, I was already smoking and smoking marijuana, drinking, you know, drugs, and and I started drinking more and more. I started drinking and drinking and drinking, 
and I started drinking a fifth of alcohol a day, a fifth of hard alcohol. I got to a point where I was just so stressed out. And of course, you know, with alcohol comes violence and it comes depression. And so with me and my wife, it, you know, alcohol and wives don't mix. So, you know, I was always arguing with the wife, socking holes in the wall, throwing stuff, yelling, kids screaming and, you know, scared because I'm going to do something to their mom or something. And, uh, and I still, you know, I think about that to this day, you know, like I wish they didn't have to go through that. And, you know, it was, it, it was, it was drastic, um, uh, you know, having to put my babies uh, through, the, through all that, you know. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's hard talking about it, but, you know, they, they love, they love me, you know, they, they love me to this day, but uh, I'm not, I have to put them through it. You know, I just became in a terrible state of depression, a terrible state. And one day I got up uh, and I was sitting there and I started thinking of not living anymore. And that went on for about a month, a couple months, about 60 days. And, and I remember a couple times literally sitting up with a knife, like, man, I just can't do it. I was breaking and, and I never thought I can break like that. I never thought I had a breaking point where I can think about actually doing something like that, you know? And I got up that one, the, one of the nights and I just started driving around, looking at who I can rob and trying to get some money. And I'm driving drunk, I'm just driving and driving. And I drive past the church and I look at the church and I don't know why, and I drive past another church, I'm looking at that church and I'm like, what's going on? And I get close to the house and I pull up to this church by my house and there's a bunch of old gray haired guys in the, in the church. I'm like, oh man. I'm like, I'm holding on to, you know, like, what, what should I, I'm going to rob somebody or go into this church, what I'm going to do. And so I take my butt home, I get home, and I sit there until I fall asleep. And I fall asleep, and I, and I hear a big knock at the door. You know, like, boom, boom, boom. And I open the door, and it's, it's a probation officer. It's a PO. And he's like, you haven't reported in a couple months. I was so depressed and stressed that I forgot to report to the PO, you know. And so he grabs my hand and turns me against the wall, and I start yelling. I'm like, man, my, my baby and my sons are woke at this time. They heard the knocking, too. And they're looking like, what's going on? You know, terrified. I'm like, man, I'll walk with you to the car. You don't have to grab my arm and do that all in front of the kids. I'm not irate, you know. So uh, he calls back up and all that. And I get to the jail, and he walks. He's at this window talking, and he comes talk over to me, and I'm sitting in my chair slumped, just stressed out of my mind. Like everything's caving in. And so he's like, you got a warrant. I said, what? I got a warrant, a warrant from a crime I committed three years prior. And I was, I was shocked. I was like, what? Three years prior, you know? And so I get upstairs and I'm sitting on my jail bunk and I'm sitting there wall, everything's caving in. And mind you, I've been in jail. So it's not the jail. I'm not scared to be in jail. And so I'm th looking at the guard. I'm like, I'm about to call a doctor, a psych a doctor or something, I need to take some meds because I'm, I'm tripping out. And um, and I get back and, and I didn't go up there and talk to him for the doctor, but I'm sitting there and I'm like, if there's some type of God, something, I'm stressed out of my mind. I'm just talking on my bed. I remember it vividly. And uh, I'm like, if there's a God or something, you need to come and show right now. Or I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, I don't want to live. And the very next night, um, they call for a Bible study. And um, I could not I couldn't sit on the bed, you know, I could not sit. I had to get up. It was, it was like a pushing, like I had to, had to go. And I looked around at the guys, you know, you got, you got people from gangs and skinheads and different people, you know, you're looking around like, okay, if you get up and you go into this meeting, then, you know, you're gonna be soft. You know, you go into the meeting, I was just playing dominoes and cards with these guys, you know, shooting the game with them and talking crazy. You know, and uh, so I just could not resist. I had to get up and I got into in line and we got over to that Bible study. And it was two guys in there, two, two old gray hair guys sitting in there. And uh, so I'm just listening to them. And the whole time I'm sitting there, I got a little shake to my body. I'm sitting there like, I don't know why I'm in here. What, you know, what's going on? And uh, and he's sitting there and he's talking about uh, the love of God and and repentance and God can forgive me 
And I was just thinking like, okay, he he must don't know what you know stuff I didn't been involved in, the stuff I did to people, to destroy their lives, because a lot of my family don't even know, you know. And uh, God will never forgive the stuff I did in private and secret, you know. He'll never forgive it. But uh, you know, at the end, you know, I accepted Christ. I, I I believed. I don't know. I started crying. I broke down. I just uh, God, you know, God. He just he was like a weight, it's like a breath of fresh air just uh, lifted off of me. It was like I had new life. You know, it's hard to explain the whole experience. Uh, it's really, I didn't turn over a new leaf. I didn't become a better person. God changed my life. It's not nothing I conjured up, you know. And then I got back after the Bible study. I went to, uh, back to my dorm. I went to a dorm because, uh, and I started uh, telling skinheads, I started talking to people. I was antisocial and suicidal. And I went back to the dorm, like, full of joy, and I was talking to these people. My wife could tell you, I wouldn't even talk, I wouldn't even talk to her, you know? So I just went back, and I started telling people about what Christ has done. What God, I told a guy in the bathroom that I loved him, you know, because he was worried about his case. I said, man, brother, you got me, I, you know, and he just, he didn't understand it. But, uh, you know, <sighs> you know, right after that, uh, people from 18 all the way to 80 years old, God was using me to talk to them, and they would break down. I was like, me? How is he using me to talk to these people and touch these people? And sooner or later, God opened up the door to where I was able to lead a prayer and a Bible study in there. Me, Tommy, you know, I was like, what? You know, and I had a prayer circle with these guys in there in tears and crying, some of the best fellowship I ever had in my life still, you know, with these, with these guys, inmates. And uh, the guards were on with it. The guys, the guards were on with it. There's like, okay, you can use this room, a storage room, to have a Bible study. God opened up that door for me, and I led probably about 40 of them to Christ when I was in there. Me, I didn't know the Bible. I'm not a theologian, but God was using me. I couldn't help. I couldn't help but share uh, Christ. It was a. I set up a song, a proverb every day when you go to breakfast at four in the morning. A proverb. I've had this big old thing. I wrote it big so people can see because they got to walk past. All the inmates got to walk past it. And you have some guards come and slap it on the floor. And you have some. But everybody will stop and read the proverbs. And so people started coming. And I didn't know really much about the Bible, you know. But I read through it in but three months, like two times. You know, read through the Bible. I was read, praying all night. up, And God was using me. It was an exciting time. It was like the most exciting time of my life in jail, you know. And so... You know, God is good, man. And when I, and you know, the good, good thing, when I went to court for my tr my final date for them to sentence me, when they went, when I went there, I had a song in my heart. I was sitting right there after, uh, right before I talked to the DA and apologized and the judge. I told them, I was singing. I was like, Lord, I wasn't even caring. I didn't even care what they were going to do. I was singing in my heart. And uh, I was singing right there. I was singing. And um, I told the DA, I said, you know, I'm sorry. I committed that. And judge, I'm sorry. And they gave me, uh, they sent me back, and I didn't get the 10 years. They gave me a year county. I got out two, like less than a week later on house arrest. And uh, boy, I tell you, when I got out, oh, that's when all oh, God's really started using me. And when I got out, I just could not believe that He would use somebody like me. And uh, I was, I was like, okay, I didn't care about a job. I didn't care about nothing. You know, I was worried about sharing the gospel wherever I went. I was like, okay, I'm on the bus. I'm going to talk to this lady. Talk to Every day he would send me two or three people to, to talk to. A lady, a lady with AIDS, another lady with cancer who accepted Christ right on the street. Um, another guy who just lost his wife and he was about to commit suicide at home. He had a car, but he was on the bus that day because he wanted to travel on the bus. And uh, he went from tears to laughing on the bus, you know, after we shared Christ with him. And... Um, and I can keep going, but more, God was just leading people to me. He was just leading people, and I was able to, I don't know, and I, he was just using me in unique ways to touch people, and I was i was just mind blown. I'm still, I, I'm still mind blown at, at just what God's doing in my life today. And not worrying about a job, uh, you know, the Lord I, led me to dental tech school where uh, they don't do background checks and stuff, so I had to, it's up to the doctor to hire me. and. And guess what? Come to find out, I'm going to a Bible study for a year at my brother's church. And 
Come to find out, there's a guy who I've been fellowshipping the whole time who said, hey, what are you going to school for? I told him, he said, you know what? I own a dental lab and I'm on house arrest, fresh out of jail. And he says, I have a dental lab, introducing me to the doctor and I'm hired into the office only a month in the school on house arrest. Now, if that doesn't look like God's hand on it, I don't know what is. Well, since I've been saved, uh, me and my family life has uh, grown. My kids cling to me more. Uh, they're more attentive. They listen more. Sometimes, sometimes. You know, the kids can be knuckleheads. But uh, my wife, she just, uh, she sees the growth. She sees Christ. And that led her to Christ. You know, we both got baptized together. And my house is growing. Uh, we're growing in family prayer. My son leads uh, every night for dinner and prayer. My eight-year-old which uh, he's a blessing. He gets out there and he passes tracks out with us about the gospel. So my family uh, has really been affected by it. Also through our prayers, my father who's facing life in jail right now. He's his first time, his first time he's, he's going to a Bible study in there. That's mind blowing. My family is like, what? You know him, one of the first gang, black crip gang members in LA, you know, he, he, he's even going to a Bible study. So God's good, he's answering prayer. Um, and I wasn't married before I was saved. I got out and God convicted me, convicted me, and I just could not deal with it. And I'm like, Lord, we need to get married. We need to get married right away. And, um, and we got married. We got married. We've been together 10 years now, and we've been married for three. So, you know, I thank God for, for that beautiful woman who stuck by me all these years through all this stuff I put it through. I don't see how anybody can stick in there, but only God can place those type of uh, uh, wives in our lives, you know, uh, who can deal with our stuff, you know what I mean? And um, I'm just so grateful for that. Blood in, blood out. The statement is true. The only end for a hopeless life is death. But death doesn't end our troubles. The Bible tells us, for it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. The only escape from God's judgment is to place our hope and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, his shed blood on Calvary. What happened in Tommy Scott's life can happen in yours. It doesn't matter what sins you have committed, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves you. He gave his son to die for you. He wants to give you a hope and a future. Why would you reject so great a gift? Accept God's salvation today before it's too late.